So we've been talking about non-interference in preschool and three cultures revisited and looking at some of the implications of that. And I just went through um, really this whole section from page 108 and uh, trying to get at what some of the Japanese perspectives were when it came to non-interference and then some of the criticisms that were levied against that as documented by Tobin and, and his co-authors. One thing that we haven't really talked about and something that's interesting to think about and, and promise you we're getting around to globalization and contextualization and, and eventually is that uh, there's quite a bit of literature out there and by Japanologists and other who, others who study Japanese culture that especially when in, in regards to education there is this philosophy that intelligence is learned and that virtue is learned so intelligence virtue and learning go hand in hand so the reason why that's important is because the, the behavior of teachers and the role that teachers play in addressing uh, situations like with now or like with Hiroki in the uh, earlier version of preschool and three cultures is that the non-interventionist approach is allowing for intelligence and virtue to happen together, to be learned together. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't problems with that, and I'm not saying that this is you know, a great way to do things. Uh, I'm also not saying it's a bad way. What I'm saying is that this is a unique, contextualized, philosophical approach to education. And so we had a, a discussion in, on both the discussion board and uh, briefly in the screencast, I'm sure we'll have more in, in class next week, about uh, Confucianism and education in China. And now we're having this discussion about this Japanese philosophy about intelligence and virtue both being learned and going hand to hand. And so there being some reason why uh, teachers and students interact the way that they do or don't in uh, education. And what we're finding is that there's, there's kind of a distinction between uh, what happens in school. And again, we're talking about preschool, so it's a unique context. However, can we say that there is some sort of a distinction between the, the like formal education and the curriculum that is delivered and the local culture or national context or whatever that the schools and education is embedded in. In other words, there's something about education, and, and we've argued this uh, throughout the, the course so far, that seems to be shared across cultures and communities. Some of it has to do with structure, some of it has to do with roles, some of it has to do with expectations, some of it has to do with the intangible sort of experiences that occur within school. And, and I think we could provide, you know, sheets and sheets and sheets of paper that would list all of the things about education that are shared from one place to another. I'm currently sitting in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. If I go to any school here, I can start to list all the things that I find are similar just from observing, just from sitting in the school and looking. And if I went and talked to people about their experiences, I would find more and more similarities. However, we can also make a list probably just as long, maybe a little more difficult to, to make the list, but, but we could, that was about unique experiences. So this Japanese example with now is the unique experience or one of many unique experiences. This non-interference approach is a unique Japanese approach and it's different from academic content. It's different from organizational structure. It's different from those things and yet it's somehow embedded within it. So we have here a, a really a, a very complex a very intricate example of how the, the the institution of education is global but the experiences and the practice and the ideologies uh, of the community where education exists uniquely move it they, they provide unique experiences Let's go on to another example from uh, Preschool and Three Cultures Revisited. 
Again, uh, several of you made comments already on the discussion board about this, which I really appreciate, and it had to do with mixed age interaction. Uh, again, hearkening back to the original preschool and three cultures, there was an example where older children were helping to take care of younger children, and it was sort of the exception more than the rule. And then they noted in the Japan chapter uh, for Komatsudani in particular now, or now being preschool and three cultures revisited, that this mixed age interaction was uh, more formalized. It had become um, more institutionalized and was happening more regularly. And so it was, uh, it, it was interesting because this mixed age interaction now was, um, uh, uh, you know, seemed to be uh, something that was becoming part of the way that school was done in Japan. And what we find is that, uh, you know, I've got the, the quote here from uh, page 113, is that when they went back to visit several years after they had done the field work for Preschool and Three Cultures Revisited, they learned that the institutionalized form of mixed-aged interaction was on temporary hold and that even when it was in place, the children were not required to participate in it. Um, it was just that older children sometimes spontaneously care for younger ones. Well, regardless of whether it's institutionalized or not, this mixed-age interaction was a big deal. Uh, a lot of people paid attention to it both in the 80s and now. And the idea was that by, by crossing across ages, um, there's something extra that can be offered to children, and it's somehow more enriching. Now, what I find interesting about mixed age interaction is that the, the more institutionalized form of formal education has ages and grades, and that interaction is often restricted uh, by age and grade among students in particular. And that this mixed age interaction in Japan seemed to be an example of a contextualized version of formal uh, mass education. Now, one of the things that uh, I, I noticed, and several of you made comments on the discussion board already, and so I'm taking some of your comments here. Uh, two comments in particular from the discussion board that I wanted to mention. One was, uh, one said, having the elder kids to take care of the younger ones would definitely help continue the collective culture rather than losing it over the generations. So the idea was that age-graded mass education was somehow going to um, disintegrate or um, not support the reproduction of a collective culture that, uh, that is seen in Japan. Um, and that by having older kids and younger kids interacting with one another in a way that was institutionalized in the education system was, was a form, a, a contextualization of education, of mass education, that was uh, really um, um, taking the local culture and embedding it in that institutionalized form. And again, what we see is that they put it on temporary hold, that it wasn't necessarily fully institutionalized. And so there might be something different about how local culture or context uh, interacts with the globalized or institutionalized structure of education that resists having it become uh, formally institutionalized, having local context and culture become formally institutionalized, even though it is it is quite highly embedded in the day-to-day -day activities and expectations and ideologies that people bring into the schools. Another comment was uh, that it is impressive that older children voluntarily help the younger ones, and what is more are willing to do so. I can clearly see the advantages of this idea. It is true that in, it requires utmost caution of teachers, but it is undeniable that such a practice teaches independence, empathy, and reliability that is going to be invaluable in a child's life. I can only imagine the responsibility a child feels when he or she is helping a younger child. So. By the way, that's a really interesting quote uh, or comment, and that's why I put the whole thing there. But the part that I want to pay attention to is the part right in the middle that says, it is true that it requires utmost caution of teachers. Now, the, the person who made this comment did not go on to explain that, or at least I don't remember uh, going on to explain exactly what was meant by that. But I think that the way that I interpret that is that there is some responsibility that the teacher has for the safety, development, and education of the children that are in their school. And that by having older and younger children mixed together, there is a, uh, there's the potential 
for harm or for um, unsafety that might occur. And so the role of the teacher is actually embedded in this comment, an expectation about the role of the teacher, that the, the, the role of the teacher there is to, and remember when we looked at the purpose of preschool earlier, is to educate, is to nurture, is to you know take care and, and move these children through the early stages of education. That itself is an institutionalized expectation for teachers that accompanies the, the, the mass education system worldwide. And so having this nice, nicely placed contrast, whether you meant to do this or not, whoever put this there, whether you meant to do this or not, having this there I think is a really interesting comment on the expectations that we bring with us to the role of teacher and teacher-student interaction. Next, I want to talk about uh, the part in the uh, chapter on Japan that talked about bodies and how interaction around the physical intimacy occurs. Um, this is uh, from page 116. It says, the scenes in our Kamatsudani video of male and female staff members physically caring for young children, along with the scenes of staff ex accepting, even expecting children to get dirty, to interact physically, and to enjoy and take an interest in bodily functions, suggests a greater ease with the body than we see in our Chinese and American videos. Right? Okay, so that's interesting. There is a, a different ideology, a different expectation about what kind of physical intimacy is appropriate in uh, Japan in particular. And if we look at this uh, body's interaction thing, from the class discussion board. Uh, again, this is just one person's comment. This person said, I found it strange that teachers from other countries criticized displays of physical intimacy between male staff members and young children. I think that here, the rhetoric itself encourages criticism rather than the practice. In other words, when we're talking about preschool children, physical intimacy should not be perceived in the sense it is usually understood in the West. When I was growing up, I was treated the same way described in the chapter, and not for a second did I find it strange. The reason was that Ukraine, well now we know who wrote this comment, similar to Japan, has a high contact culture, whereas the West is characterized by a low contact culture. Neither of them is better than the other, but when it comes to educate, education, it is of utmost importance to realize what type of culture teachers are dealing with. In high contact cultures, physical contact is emphasized and is considered important. Now let me take that a step further and say that I think this dichotomy that we tend to draw between the West and everywhere else is, a, is again a, another false dichotomy. Because expectations about bodies and interaction it isn't just um, the West broadly speaking or the non-West broadly speaking. I'll give you an example. Uh, several years ago, we had a pretty active program with working with uh, some schools and communities in disadvantaged parts of South Africa. And in those communities, there's a very high rate of uh, sexual abuse of children by adults. And part of the, the expectation, part of the, the, the teacher's expectation was that they would try as hard as possible to separate children from any sort of over uh, zealous physical contact because they knew that if that in the past, anyway, there had been issues of rape, of um, sexual mistreatment and, and abuse that had occurred not just between teachers and students, but among students, even at the primary school age. But on top of that was laid an ideology that sort of shamed people, even teachers, for talking about that as a problem, for, for, for sexualizing young children and saying that they could even be involved in this at all. And as a result, there was a resistance to even recognizing that this was a problem because even though it was something that, that teachers would try to resist, they wouldn't openly discuss it because it was considered taboo to talk about children in any way that wasn't just assuming their innocence. Now, I have to say, the, the disadvantaged communities in the Western Cape, that's not the West, people. Right? I mean, that is, that is a, a low-contact ideology, even though what may be happening is much more high-contact. So where I'm going with this is, let's, let's be careful with the dichotomies again. All right, I have a little more to say about this. We're going to pause, and we're going to come back in the next screencast.